The Endless Step by Esther Houtzig Prologue The flatness of this land was awesome. There wasn't a hill in sight. It was an enormous, unrippled sea of parched and lifeless grass. Tata, why is the earth so flat here? These must be the steps, Esther. Steps, but the steps are in Siberia. This is Siberia, he said quietly. If I had been told that I had been transported to the moon, I could not have been more stunned. Siberia, my voice trembled, but Siberia is full of snow. It will be, my father said. Siberia. Siberia was the end of the world, a point of no return, where the punishment was unbelievably cruel and where people died like flies. Siberia was the tundra and the mountainous drifts of snow. Siberia was wolves. I had been careless. I had neglected to pray to God to save us from a gypsum mine in Siberia. And here's a picture of the author when she was a young girl when that hap when this happened to her. <clears throat> Chapter 1. The morning it happened. The end of my lovely world. I did not water the lilac bush outside my father's study. The time was June 1941, and the place was Vilna, a city in the northeastern corner of Poland. And I was 10 years old, and, it took, and took it quite for granted that all over the globe people tended their gardens on such a morning as this. Wars and bombs stopped at the garden gates, happened on the far side of the garden walls. Our garden was the center of my world, the place above all others where I wished to remain forever. The house we lived in was built around this garden, its red tiled roof slanting toward it. It was a very large and dignified house with a white plaster facade. The people who lived in it were my people, my parents, my paternal grandparents, my aunts and my uncles and my cousins. My grandfather owned the house. My grandmother ruled the house. They lived rather majestically in their own apartment, and the rest of us lived in six separate apartments. Separate, but not exactly private. There were no locked doors. People were always rushing in and out of each other's apartments to borrow things, to gossip, to boast a bit or complain a bit, or to tell the latest family joke. It was a great, exuberant, busy, loving family, and heaven for an only child. Behind the windows looking out on our garden, there were no strangers, no enemies, no hidden danger. <coughs> Excuse me. Beyond the garden, beginning with the tree-lined avenue we lived on, was Vilna, my city. For the best view of Vilna, one went to the top of Castle Hill, and I was always asking Miss Rachel, my governess, to take me there. Built along the banks of the river Ouija, in a basin of green hills, Vilna had been called a woodland capital. It was a university town, a city of parks and white churches with gold and red towers built by Italian architects in an opulent Baroque style, a city of lovely old houses hugging the hills and each other. It was a spirited and gay city for a child to grow up in. From this hilltop, I could make out the place where my family's business took up half a block, the synagogue we attended, the road that led to the idyllic lake country where we had our summer house. When I stood on this hilltop, everything was just as it should be in the best of all possible worlds, my world. And down to the smallest detail, I would not have any of it changed. What I ate for breakfast on school mornings was one buttered roll, a soft roll, not a hard roll, and one cup of cocoa. Any attempt to alter this menu, I regarded as a plot to poison me. I would sit down to this breakfast at a round table in the dining room with my young parents or my beloved Miss Rachel. My father, called Tata, the Polish for Papa, was my most favorite person in the world, a secret that I thought I ought to keep from Mama. Tata was gay and fun-loving and not only made jokes himself, but laughed at mine, whether mine were funny or not. Mama was gay, too, with an engaging talent for laughing over spilled milk. But at an early age, I found out that she was a strong-minded lady 
who thought that one indulgent parent was quite enough for an only child. When I was four years old, she and I first locked horns. I had just begun to attend a progressive nursery school, and one morning, when I and a dozen or so other little girls were doing calisthenics on the floor, I made a shattering discovery. All legs had been swung back over heads. All toes were touching the floor. When rolling my eyes from side to side, I saw that all the panties thus displayed were silk, white, pink, blue, yellow silk, a gorgeous rainbow of silk panties, some even edged with lace, except mine. Mine were white cotton, severely unadorned. I told Mama that this situation must be corrected immediately. She thought not. I said that if I could not wear silk panties, I would not go to nursery school at all. Mama said, very well, don't go. I didn't go. I stayed home until it was time for me to go to grade school when I was seven. And when it came to choosing the school, Mama decided that it was character building for a rich child to go to the school where there were children from all economic brackets. I went to the Sofia Markovna Gorowitz School, where I learned Yiddish and was introduced to the literature and culture of my people. I love school, and I love the order of my life. My days are planned with the precision of a railroad schedule. On Mondays after school, there were piano lessons, Tuesday, dancing lessons, Wednesdays I went to the library, and invariably argued with the librarian who recommended children's books when I wanted grown-up books, particularly mysteries, and the more blood-curdling, the better. On, Tuesdays, my on Thursdays, my cousins and I had calisthenics with a muscular lady who drilled us as if we were candidates for the Prussian Army, which made us explode into giggles. And on Fridays, I was allowed to help Mama and the cook prepare the Sabbath meals, braid the challah, the ritual bread, and chop noodles. On Fridays, the seven kitchens of our house would send forth the marvelous smells of seven Sabbath meals, all alike, the same breads, sponge cakes, chickens, and chicken soup. But in 1939, Hitler's armies marched on Poland. When the first bombs fell over Vilna, I was terrified, of course, but we were lucky. No bombs fell in our garden. Our garden was invulnerable. To be sure, there were changes. Tata was drafted into the Polish army to fight the German invaders, but Mama assured me that he would come back. She continued to do so in the face of considerable evidence to the contrary, and since I had great faith in Mama, I believed her. I was the only one who did. Shortly after Tata left, word came that his entire battalion had been wiped out. Our family was stricken with a deep and inconsolable grief. Everyone, that is, except Mama and me. Mama told them to stop their weeping, that Tata was alive. They looked up from their grief and begged her to come to her senses and accept the dreadful reality. They understood that this aberration came from her great love for her husband, but when she went so far to have a fight with the rabbi about it, they were beside themselves. On a Monday morning, Mama woke up and announced to anyone who would listen to her that Tata would be back in Vilna on Thursday. She advised everyone to stop weeping and prepare for his return. Be sure to get me some farmer's cheese, the kind he adores, she said to her poor mother, who now wept not only for the lost son-in-law, but for the daughter gone crazy. Mama herself had our house shined from top to bottom, and our larder stocked with Tata's favorite foods. On Thursday, Tata returned, just as Mama had predicted. But by way of preparing for everyone for the surprise, he stopped at his mother-in-law's house first. My grandmother opened the door, took one look at this ghost, and screamed, Oh, dear Lord, I didn't get the cheese. At eight, I took Mama's psychic powers for granted. Over and over, Tata told us how he had walked from village to village after his battalion was disbanded. The few men who had survived were told to make their way home as best they could. Dressed in a blanket and with a beret on his head, pretending he was mad, Tata had many narrow escapes before he came back to us. He was home, but in the next two years there would be other changes. In 1940, the Russians, who were then allied with Germany, occupied Vilna. They confiscated the family business and our property, but did not evict us from our house 
our garden. The servants left and Miss Rachel got married. One didn't always have so small luxuries, but I did miss them. My world was still intact, and I had not the slightest premonition that it was about to end. The morning it happened, I awakened very early for a reason. Since school was over, I was allowed to sleep late. Naturally, in order to enjoy such a special privilege, one had to be awake. The minute I opened my eyes and saw my pink and white curtains fluttering in the soft breeze blowing off the Ouija, I knew it was going to be a beautiful day, a perfect June day. Heeding our family tradition, I was careful to slip out of bed with my right foot forward. Right foot forward, good luck for the day. Left foot forward, bad luck. In Poland, one listened to one's family if one wanted good luck. I went to the window to see if Grandfather was in the garden. The garden was the pride and joy of his life. It was he who gave the gardeners their orders, scolded when a tree had not been properly pruned, was lavish with his praise when an ailing plant was saved. Remember, children, he would say to my cousins and me, remember there's always some good in people who love flowers. That morning, Grandfather was not in the garden but I leaned out the window for a minute to admire the roses and the peonies and the lilac bush, which I would water in an hour or two, I thought. It must have been about six o'clock. I picked up the mystery I had been saving for just such a morning and went back to bed with it. From the opening sentence, I was lost to the rest of the world. Hence, I heard nothing. I was well into the book when my mother burst into the room. You must get up immediately, she said, stripping the bedclothes off me. But why, Mama? I was outraged. Esther, for once, do as you're told without asking questions. Quickly. I jumped out of bed. Mama, what is it? Questions, always questions. Keep your voice down. She had dropped hers to a whisper. Esther, something is happening. Uncle David called. He said, <clears throat> he said that the Russian soldiers were swarming all over Grandfather's apartment. Your father rushed there. He didn't even stop to dress. He's still in his pajamas. And he isn't back yet. Please get dressed as fast as you can and come right to my room. Russian soldiers? I didn't argue. I did as I was told, braiding my hair as I went. I found my mother sitting on her bed with a large kitchen matchbox on her lap. What on earth was Mama planning to do with matches in her bedroom? And why was she looking at me so oddly? Could she be frightened? You are to take this box to my mother's house, Esther, to your grandmother, Sarah, immediately. A matchbox to Grandmother Sarah? Whatever for? Esther, her voice was trembling. Stop asking questions. Just do as you're told. Take this box to your grandmother. I have a feeling we won't be needing what I've put inside. I want Grandmother to have it. You are to leave by way of the garden gate. Don't go out on the street. Go through the alleys. Go quickly and come back as quickly as you can. Do you hear me? You are not to linger at your grandmother's, not for one extra minute. I almost dropped the box. Esther, Mama's voice became gentle. Esther, I'm sorry that I was cross, but oh, do hurry, for God's sake, hurry. I was scared, more scared than I had been when Vilna was being bombed. Even a child soon learns what bombing is all about, learns to know what might happen and to be relieved when it doesn't. But now I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know how to say my prayer, how to bargain with God. One needed to be explicit, I thought, as a child. Dear God, please do not let the bomb fall on the Rudmanen house on Great Puklanka Avenue in Vilna. If you will be kind enough to see this doesn't happen, I promise that I will try not to talk back to my mother tomorrow. I had tried to bargain fairly during the German bombings in 1939, but now I couldn't pray. There was no dark bomb shelter, no lap in which to bury my face when the bomb was too close. No soothing words from Mama to ease the terror of glass breaking and bricks falling. I ran through my father's study into the garden. The minute I crossed the door, I knew I had made a mistake. I had put my left foot forward. I wanted to go back and start over again with the right foot, but I was afraid to waste time. As I ran, I touched the lilacs and inhaled their fragrance. I would water them later. The garden had not changed. My garden was just as beautiful, just as safe as always, as if there was nothing to threaten my life in it. It would be waiting for me when I returned from this bewildering errand. I went to the back gate and out into the alley. I flew through the alley, 
Mercifully, it was deserted that morning. Running as fast as I could, within ten minutes, I was at the apartment house where my grandmother lived. But once there, I did have to stop to catch my breath before, before I could climb the stairs two at a time. There was no answer to my first ring, nor to my second. I pounded on the door with the heel of my shoe. Finally, my grandmother's sleepy voice called out, Who is it? Me, grandmother. Let me in. She opened the door and began firing questions at me. Why was I visiting so early? Why was I out of breath? What was in the box? I wanted to shout at her the way that my mother had. No questions. I don't have the answers. Instead, I told her what I knew, that the soldiers were in Grandfather Solomon's house, that Tata went there in his pajamas. In his pajamas, she asked, as if that were the most terrifying fact of all. Yes, in his pajamas, I repeated, beginning to react to, the, to this with terror myself. I handed her the box, and when she opened it, we both gaped. My mother's emeralds and other jewels were lying there in that kitchen matchbox, her necklace earrings and all her rings. They looked so strange, lying there out of their velvet boxes, like play jewelry. My grandmother closed the box. She shut her eyes, and her lips moved in prayer. Grandmother, I must go. Grandmother, Mama said, I must come back quickly. Grandmother... I guess Mama had a reason for sending you her jewelry? She went on with her praying. I stood on tiptoe and kissed her cheek. I hugged her and rested my cheek against her arm. I longed to tell her how much I loved her and how much she meant to me. How well I remembered all the days she spent with me when I was little, cutting out paper dolls, building cardboard houses. But there was no time. I could only manage to say, I love you, Grandmother. I love you so much. <clears throat> oh, my child, tell your mother. She broke off and kissed the top of my head. I will see you soon, grandmother, I said, as I ran out the door. As I ran down the stairs, a terrible thought came to me. I would never see my grandmother again. Oh, God, please don't let me have such terrible thoughts, I prayed. I ran all the way home. When I reached the garden door, I could hear the front doorbell ringing and ringing. Where was Mama? My mother was sitting in the dining room at the empty dining table, resting her chin in her hand. Mama, the doorbell is ringing. Do you, don't you hear it? Shall I open the door? No, I'll open it myself. But she still didn't move. Sit down, Esther. You're out of breath. Did you give the box to Grandmother? Of course I did, Mama. The doorbell. Yes, the doorbell. She rose slowly, and taking a long time to get there, she opened the door. My father was on the doorstep, his hands behind his back. Next to him stood two Russian soldiers with fixed bayonets. Not one word was spoken. Father and mother exchanged a guarded look, but father kept his eyes away from me, as if he was ashamed to have me see him in pajamas with bayonets at his back. <coughs> Excuse me. Slowly and silently, father walked through the hall, past the umbrella stand with his walking sticks into the dining room. The soldiers walked heavily beside him. When they reached the center of the room, the silence was broken. One of the soldiers shouted, Down on the floor, all of you! You're under arrest! Clearly, before we would do such a silly thing, my father would explain everything, and the soldiers would go away. He had not done anything wrong, neither stolen nor killed anyone, nor committed any other crime. They could not arrest him. He would insist that they apologize, but he remained silent. We sat on the floor, first my father, then me. For a second, I thought my mother would refuse to. My father must have thought so too, because he murmured her name softly, Rhea. Very awkwardly, but determined to keep her back straight, my mother sat down on the floor too. How could we be arrested without having done anything wrong? I decided to find out. Why are we under arrest? I asked. My mother lifted an admonishing hand, but it was too late. The soldiers looked from me to my suddenly very pale parents and then at each other. The one who had issued the order had bright little eyes and an extraordinary broad nose. It was he who pulled out a long white paper and read from it. You are capitalists and therefore enemies of the people. You are to be sent to another part of our great and mighty country. Uh, capitalist is basically somebody who makes money with money, which is a lot of Jewish people were bankers, and that was their job, and they were wealthy. The soldier read on and on, the words seeming to pour out of his huge nostrils. 
so many words and so dull, most of them were incomprehensible to me. What was a capitalist? The only words that meant anything to me were the ones that were bringing my world to an end. I was to be taken from my home, from the city where I was born, and from the people I loved. <clears throat> I didn't feel like an enemy of the people, only an enemy of these horrid soldiers. I hated them, loathed them, despised them. I wished they were dead. My mother reached out and tried to straighten my clenched fingers. I am fine, Mama. Really, I am, I said more to reassure myself than her. The soldier stopped reading. He seemed quite satisfied that he had performed his duty admirably, and he refolded the paper as if it were a very precious document. My mother spoke quietly. Esther, you will go to your room and gather your clothes together. I didn't move. Was there to be no argument, no pleading, no miraculous adult intervention? My mother nudged me, and we both scrambled up from the floor. When my father said he would help my mother pack their things and began to get up too, the other soldier tilted his bayonet toward father and said, Don't move. Stay where you are. My father obeyed, but now he held his head in his hands. When I reached my room, I started to close my door. Leave that door open, wide open, girl, the soldier shouted. I did. I walked into my room and looked around. This was my room. My curtains were blowing in the breeze. My wallpaper continued to sprout its tiny rosebuds. My dolls were in their customary huddle on the divan. My books were on the shelves. The mystery I had been reading lay face down on the bed. No, I would not leave this room. No one could make me. I would will myself to fall down dead in a little heap on the floor before I would leave it. When that didn't work, I wanted to throw myself down on the bed and howl. But the door was open and the soldiers were out there. Whether from fear or bravado, I cannot say, but I held my tears back and began to pack. What clothes would one need in that other part of our great and mighty country? My light oak wardrobe was filled with skirts and blouses and school uniforms and party dresses. Left to myself, I was happiest in a pair of old shorts and a shirt. This brought me close to tears again. Shorts and shirt meant fun and freedom, carefree days in the country, holidays at the sea, I picked up the albums of family photographs, the record of days with my family, picnics with aunts and uncles and cousins in the woods, bathing in the sea, baby pictures, birthday parties, the photographs of the grown-ups and what we children called their clothes of olden times, the ones that sent us into fits of giggles. At once, this album became my most important possession, and I put it down on the bed along with some books, including The Unfinished Mystery. So I guess if you have 10 minutes to pack, not knowing where you're going, not knowing if you're going to be back, what would you take? What would be important to you? The album called something to my attention, something very strange indeed. The house was quiet, much too quiet. Where was everyone? I tiptoed to the window overlooking the garden. Where was Uncle David and Aunt Bertha and Aunt Sonia? Where were they? The garden was quiet and deserted. No voices, no laughter from the windows. I went back to the wardrobe with a dreadful feeling. Not fright, not anger, something nameless and worse. I gathered some clothes together and dumped them on the bed. In the dining room, my father still sat on the floor. His shoulders sagged and he looked up at me with dull, unseeing eyes. Within a single morning on a perfect June day, my young father had become an old man. Looking down at my father, I deliberately ignored the soldiers and their authority to tell me what I might and might not do, and asked for my father's permission to go to my mother. He nodded and patted my hand. My mother, too, had changed. Usually she was composed and fastidiously groomed, but now her face was flushed and her beautiful crown of braids was tumbling down. Her huge mahogany wardrobe and her bureau, normally in immaculate order, were in a wild disarray. Dresses had slipped off their hangers and lay crumpled on the floor. Lingerie spilled out of drawers. My mother was feverishly pulling clothes on the bed, zigzagging from bureaus to the wardrobe to the bed. I asked her for something to do. I had finished gathering my things and wanted desperately to be busy. Doing nothing was too frightening. Go ask your father. Can't you see I'm busy? She hid her face from me and I knew she was close to tears. Tears were against the rules of our house. Here we shared our joys and hid our sorrows. 
It had always been a hard discipline. Now it seemed like a cruel one. Why couldn't we cry like other people? If you want me, you'll know where to find me, I guess. My mother was not amused. It was a feeble joke, an old complaint that I was always disappearing, always running off to play just when I was needed. There was a stillness in the dining room. The breathing of the soldiers seemed unduly heavy, and my father's too effortful. When the telephone rang, we all started, even the soldiers. My father rose automatically, but he was pushed back roughly. A soldier picked up the phone. Comrade Yurenko here. Yes, yes, the mother and the father and the child. Yes, nothing but two old people. Across the hall with comrades Ivanov and Flipov. The rest are gone. No, I don't know. Empty apartments. Ten minutes is all that is needed. The phone went down with a bang. Yurenko ordered my father to get dressed and get packed. I didn't know what to do or where to go. I settled on staying in the hall near my parents' room. It seemed as if only a few seconds had passed before Yurenko wanted to know if they were ready. Certainly not, my mother said. Not nearly ready, comrade. I admired my mother's bravery, but I was fearful that she had overdone it. You will be ready, all right. In exactly ten minutes, we are leaving. Not one minute more. Wisely, my mother didn't argue. She asked father to pack a wicker hamper with things like bed linen, a comforter, pillows, a pot or two, and some cutlery. To use where, I wondered. Somehow, before she left the bedroom, she managed to whisper to father there was a little money hidden in her vanity. When she came to my room carrying some of her clothes with her, I ran to her. Mama, there are trucks in front of our house. I saw them. She stood still for a second. So, so there are trucks. Why haven't you put your things into a suitcase? Mama, will we have to ride in the trucks like horses? I don't know. What difference does it make, Esther? Esther, why didn't you do what you were told to do? Fetch a bag immediately. I could not tell her that to close a suitcase on my belongings was more than I could bring myself to do, that I wanted to delay the finality of that snap as long as possible. Mama, where is everyone? Aunt Sonia and Uncle David. Hush, Esther, they've gone. They left when they heard the soldiers. Esther, you simply cannot take these. She was holding the photo albums. We need every bit of room for our clothes. Agree or disagree? Oh, please, please, I need them so badly. Truly, I do. I will put them in the bottom of the valise, and I'll just take fewer clothes. I don't need clothes nearly as much. I'd rather go barefoot. My mother ignored me and started sorting the clothes, her hands moving with a nervous speed. Close to hysterics, I begged and pleaded. She became impatient and finally very stern. The albums were not to go. Looking over her shoulder first, she whispered that someone was bound to question us about the people in those albums. <clears throat> Although I didn't understand the implications of this, something in her voice silenced me. Holding back my tears, I returned the albums to the shelf. Surreptitiously, so I stroked them, saying my farewell. Mother left, and I stuffed the clothes into the bag, helter-skelter. My clothes consisted of some panties, vests, and slips, a nightgown, some socks, and handkerchiefs, a navy blue woolen school skirt, a white cotton blouse, a red and blue woolen sweater, and three cotton dresses. I had trouble stuffing a winter coat in and considered leaving it out. Fortunately, I didn't. That morning, I was wearing a blue cotton dress, summer socks, and black oxfords. The doorbell rang, and I felt a great surge of hope. Someone had come to save us. I flew into the dining room and looked onto the hall. Yurenko was opening the door. My mother brushed past me into the vestibule. Who is this man? Yurenko asked. Mother looked into her brother Lusk's white face and quietly said, I don't know. I have never seen him before. The soldier kicked the door shut. As mother turned, I was about to ask her why she had said that when I remembered the albums and held my tongue. Yurenko looked at his watch. Your ten minutes is up. Get going. I ran for my suitcase just as father came out of the bedroom. Carrying two traveling cases, pigskin lined with Morocco, he looked like a gentleman off on a holiday jaunt, one badly in need of a holiday. Mother followed him, carrying the wicker hamper. When we walked out of our home into the bright sunshine, I realized that once again I had stepped out with my left foot forward. But this time I knew there was no right foot any place on earth to save us. Only one truck remained, and it was waiting for us. 
It was filled with a blur of silent people. But on the sidewalk, there was a murmur from dozens of curious onlookers. I couldn't understand what they were saying, nor did it matter. Yurenko ordered us onto the truck. My father put his bags down and picked me up. I buried my face in his shoulder, and he held me tighter. He sat me down gently next to a woman in a silk dress. The woman didn't move. Father helped mother, who held her head high, but whose cheeks were flaming throughout the awkward business of hoisting herself up. The suitcases and the hamper were next, and then father. Out of the blur of faces, I saw my grandfathers and grandmothers. There were no other members of our family on the truck. I waved to my grandparents, but they made no sign that they had seen me. I lowered my eyelids. It was a good thing to do. It made it easier to face the crowd gawking at us from the street. It also made things move away, away from me, leaving me in a half-real daydream. Rhea! I heard my mother's name being called. Grandmother Sarah was standing alongside the truck. She looked at mother, then covered her face with her hands. The back door of the truck was bolted, and the motor started. The truck began to rumble down Great Pordlanka Avenue, past our white house with its mahogany door, a curtain blowing out the dining room window, past our garden wall, down the avenue where I knew each house, each tree, each chipped stone on the sidewalk. Beneath my lowered lids, I watched my world disappear forever. I heard our names called hysterically. Rhea, Samuel, Esther, what is happening? Where are they taking you? The voice faded, but I recognized my Aunt Sonia racing after the truck with her arms outstretched and her hair flying in the wind. Oh, Sonia, I called out to her and began to sob. My mother pressed my shoulder and softly urged me to stop weeping. I heard some others on the truck also whisper a soft shh, shh, but I didn't stop. I thought it was time to weep. Everyone else was quiet, rumbling past the streets and the green parks and the marketplace of Vilna. In the bright sunlight, they saw their fellow citizens going about their noonday business, marketing, pausing to gossip, sunning on a park bench. Witnessing the end of their world, this particularly particular truckload of people was silent. At the railroad station, all was confusion. A huge mass of people was milling about. Trucks, hundreds of them, were arriving from all directions, each one jammed with people. I searched for a familiar face, but saw only the stricken faces of strangers. Why us? The questions persisted. Why us? A soldier with a much decorated chest came to our truck, a hero. He told us he would call our names, that we were to listen carefully to his orders. We listened. The list seemed interminable, but we were not overlooked. At last we heard Rudmanen Samuel, Rhea, Esther, to the second train. Rudmanen Anna, to the second train. Rudmanen Solomon, to the first train. My grandmother cried out. Never have I heard a more dreadful scream, not even in a nightmare. Torn out of this frail but proud woman, it came from an unspeakable pain, but also from fury and sheer bewilderment. I looked at my grandfather. He was looking out over the confusion of people and trucks and soldiers, seeing nothing. My grandmother was pleading with the soldier hero, my grandmother who had never in her life asked anyone for anything. <clears throat> in God's name, let me go with him. I want to go with my husband. I won't go without him. In God's name, I beg you. The medals jingled on the soldier's chest as he threw back his shoulders. You will do as you are told. No more out of you, old woman. In the midst of her anguish, my grandmother appeared to be astonished that anyone would speak to her this way. She put a handkerchief to her mouth and made no sound. My father tried to plead with the soldier, but his words were drowned as the soldier continued to bark instruction. Finally, the last name had been called. The people who were to go on the first train made their brief farewells to their family and left the truck. My grandfather shuffled past us without a word. Solomon! My grandmother's wail slowly faded. I wedged myself between my grandmother and my father. With one hand, I stroked my grandmother's arm as she sobbed openly, and with the other hand, I clung to my father, clung fiercely lest he too be taken away from me. Who knew whether this soldier might not change his mind? When everyone who was to travel on the first train had been led away, my grandmother's sobs mingled with the quiet mass sweeping on the truck. 
The soldier ordered us to make a double line, and we were marched off to the second train. I walked with mother while my father supported grandmother. Each one of us lugged a suitcase, my mother the hamper, and mine kept bumping against my leg or against mother's. Ahead of us, the cattle cars were waiting for their human cargo. Uh, just as a note, a cattle car is a, uh, it's an open train car used to ship cattle to um, the slaughterhouses for market. 